Good afternoon. I'm Todd Lofbro. I'm the uh, chairman of uh, Jobs for the Future uh, and uh, the CEO and chairman of Viral Gains, a digital advertising technology firm. I've been involved with JFF for over a decade. And one of the things I love about the Horizons Conference is it brings together great people from all different aspects of uh, the problem we're trying to solve, which is helping historically uh, disadvantaged populations get themselves connected to family sustaining careers. We get educators, we get people from the workforce side, we get policymakers, uh, we get venture capitalists and social entrepreneurs, uh, we get academics, and I'm really thrilled with the topic we're talking about today because we have represented all those areas that I just mentioned. And we're, we're talking about one of the topics that's probably the most profound for our society over the next couple of decades. And that is the uh, impact of artificial intelligence uh, on schools, on education, and on the workforce. Uh, let me start with a brief definition of artificial intelligence. Everybody's heard of it, but you know I like to demystify these things. So at route, at root, artificial intelligence is a set of technologies, very diverse technologies, that excel in recognizing patterns in data. Uh, and they're getting smarter and smarter in their ability to do that. They're getting more and more self-directed in their ability to do that. And they're getting to a place where they can start to teach themselves patterns. So you see AI applications and things as diverse as facial recognition. You know, do I know who this person is? Or weather forecasting or uh, predicting who's going to be a good medical risk for an insurance company. Essentially, AI has become embedded and largely invisible in our society. If uh, you go to Netflix and Netflix recommends to you what movie you might like, that's actually an AI application doing that. If you go to a bank for a loan, and the bank underwrites your loan, there's probably an AI application in the background that's helping make those decisions. As you might imagine, a technology that's that pervasive and that uh, endemic to our society has lots of implications. Implications for the ethics of what you use it for and how those algorithms are built and the diversity and the knowledge of the people involved in building them. But it also has implications for jobs because uh, artificial intelligence and robotics uh, is, excels at automating away things that are repetitive. And the things that are repetitive are getting larger and larger and larger. The things that AI can do are getting larger and larger and larger. So AI is increasingly automating away jobs at the bottom of the middle class and not necessarily creating jobs at the top of the middle class at the same pace. For example, uh, most of you have experienced or seen or heard of self-driving cars. They're starting, you know, the Tesla can switch lanes and drive on the highway and a little bit in the cities. Well, there's a there's a million truck drivers in the US and whether it's going to be five years or 15 or 20 when uh, cars and trucks are automated in their driving, there'll probably be a million fewer truck driving jobs. There are over 3 million cashiers in the US. Uh, pretty much all of us have checked out of a CVS or a Walgreens at one point. Those automated checkers aren't very good right now. They're overly complicated. They ask too many questions. But, you know, you can see the evolution as they get smarter. There'll be fewer and fewer cashier jobs. So there are really two key issues we wanna address in this uh, esteemed panel today. One is how is AI gonna affect the economy? What's the impact on jobs? And what does that mean for the learners and the workers that we support as part of our mission? And the second question is, these technologies are a double-edged sword. You can actually use AI technologies in the classroom. Uh, they can actually help with pedagogy. They can help with uh, personalization of learning. So AI can not only be a, a sword that, that cuts away jobs, it can be a sword that helps in education. So we have a phenomenal panel today. I'm going to briefly introduce them and then let them introduce themselves in a little more depth. Uh, Greg Tapo is a journalist. Uh, he's co-author with uh, JFF's own Jim Tracy of the forthcoming book, Running with Robots, the American High School's Third Century. Uh, I had the great privilege of reading a number of chapters from that book, and I'll have a few questions that come from the book, but it's a phenomenal look at both the history of the American high school and uh, how the high school and classroom needs to change in its, in its third century. Noelle Silver has a very deep uh, resume and background. Uh, the latest thing on her extensive resume is she's founder of the AI Leadership Institute. She's been involved at Hacker University in training uh, organizations, universities, and, um, and employers in how to use AI and data science. She's been at Microsoft. She's uh, been at Amazon, so a great deal of background. 
in both the workforce and the education side. And finally, Professor Cynthia Brazil, who I've known for uh, longer than I want to count, uh, just a renowned roboticist, the founder of the Personal Robotics Group at MIT, Associate Director of the MIT Media Lab, and director of a relatively newer organization or initiative at MIT called RAISE, which is Responsible AI for Social Empowerment and Education, which is really looking at how to bring AI education at all levels of the education process, all the way down to middle school. So with that intro, let me start uh, with, with you, Greg, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists the same thing. Why do you care about AI and why should we care about AI? Well, thanks for having uh, me and, and thanks for this incredible panel. Um, by the way, Todd, I think you've lost the Room Raider uh, Award, Cynthia. Hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, but, no, you know, so it's a great question. Why, I, why do I care about this? Um, you know, in, in a way, it's kind of a selfish thing. I mean, it, it, it has affected my industry, journalism, um, in ways that I had never even uh, thought it would. Um, you know, talking to a couple of my colleagues a few years back, and what I learned was that, um, you know, the Associated Press, which is where I started my career, um, was using AI in a big way. Um, they um, so just a little background you so when i started with the ap in baltimore in 1998 um one of the things that you'd have to do on the weekends is a, as a kind of a standard news person they, they called us news men and news women at the time i think that's uh, an antiquated term but um you'd have to um, on the weekends you'd have to um, sit and wait for a stack of faxes to come into the bureau and um, they would be baseball box scores from minor league baseball games. And what you'd have to do is stare at it for a couple of minutes, figure out what had happened in this minor league baseball game that had just taken place, and then write a five paragraph story. Um, hmm. it, you know, the first one or two were kind of a fun challenge. Uh, and the third one, uh, and after that were an incredible bore, um, just, absolute drudgery, not what I went to school for. Um, <laughs> and so I, what I tell people is that, you know, if this is the robot apocalypse, it can't come fast enough. Um, <laughs> it really, um, it took this kind of terrible piece of drudgery out of uh, out of my hands um, because they, um, AP is now every single minor league game, uh, they're writing uh, with a with a piece of software. Um, and in addition, they're doing things like, um, you know, earnings reports for uh, for uh, Wall Street. And of course, you know, the Washington Post is now um, producing instant uh, stories for things like, um, you know, uh, congressional and local uh, elections and the Olympics. Um, so it's really happening in a big way um, in my industry. So it, to, to me, just, you know, kind of put a fine point on it. To me, it really uh, forces folks like me to think, okay, like, what do I have to do to stay competitive in this uh, industry? What do I have to do? Um, you know, that bottom 10 or 20% of, of the work that I've always done, like, what should replace it? Because I don't want to, you know, 70, 80% of my job or my salary, certainly, um, to stick around. So does it make jobs more interesting or less plentiful or both? Um, I, 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 I would say um, I would say it makes jobs certainly more interesting. Interesting. I think there are fewer jobs for writers, but there are more jobs for people sort of around the margins, right? For programmers and for um, people who um, are kind of thinking about um, what the next step is. Um, so I, I mean, if you look at you know the 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 want ads for journalism today, I mean they look like something out of uh, Google. You know, there's. <laughs> I mean, there, it's really quite kind of breathtaking what um, news organizations are looking for anymore. Fantastic. Noel, same question. Why Why do you care about AI and these topics and, and why should we care? Yeah, I, I always have to, um, like, remind, it's weird to say the years associated with this, but about 16 years ago, um, I had my first born child, a, a boy, um, and he was born with Down syndrome. And back then, it does, in, it's both not a long time ago and ancient because I had a geneticist tell me you can put him up for adoption or you can like, like, you know, basically he has no future. Um, and 
I had the, I happened to be in the right place at the right time in 2013, was at AWS, at Amazon, um, and Alexa was born. And it really, mm. my lens was already in technology. I was always looking through the world, like how do I make the world more accessible to my son? But when I found out that artificial intelligence, specifically natural language, like our world, we now have 133 devices in our home that can be controlled with a voice. And it's not because, I shouldn't say that, it's a little bit because I like it and I would do it and that I was raised on the golden age of science fiction, but it's a lot because I want my son to be able to interact with this world as easily as I do. And that's becoming more and more of a reality, certainly more than even just 10 years ago. The other side of that though, is that my dad, um, he's a Marine, uh, ran you know 11 miles every day, um, he was like 70 years old and got hit by a car and instantly became the opposite of that, right? Became, had a traumatic brain injury, had trouble using phones, computers. And now I'm dealing with, and he lives with me now, dealing with someone who is smart, like understands how the world works, is not cognitively disabled, but has trouble using the world the way it's being presented. And again, Alexa drove, I was on that team at that time. And I was like, this is world changing, <laughs> similar in a way almost anecdotal to the the story of like how it's helping journalists like so many people because ai is now available and accessible um it's changing the world for so many people in so many different ways whether it's the opportunity to do your work in a new way or maybe just interact with the world in a way you never could before so that's why i got into it um and and to this day i look everything i do i'm like are, who are we doing this for? And what is the intention? Um, because as a product, it's often the first thing we kind of, we don't ask that question first, right? Um, I remember Alexa was like Jeff Bezos's pet project. We weren't doing it to save the world. We were doing it because the 1% of the 1% wanted to talk to a device in their kitchen and that would be cool. <laughs> it turns out though, that it's amazing and it's serving people in classrooms, serving teachers and students and doing amazing things. So. So I think if I if I had my way, I would I'm trying to flip the switch a little bit, similar probably to what um, we're going to talk about in a second, but try to get in earlier and ask those questions earlier in the process so that we're building intentionally for the service of many, as opposed to accidentally, which is what I ended up experiencing at Alexa. <laughs> so you really start at inclusivity and access. Sorry, Greg. Yes. And okay. actually, I think all all things are like that, right? Like um, the best features that I love and I actually do this with my children. My son has Down syndrome, but all my kids learn sign language. All my kids did all the crazy things I did to make my son do better because he was d disabled. My typical developing kids all did the same and they're better for it. And that translates to every product I've been a part of. Like, why wouldn't I start with accessibility? Because it serves everybody. Everyone gets better when you do it that way. And so that, that's that been my journey in AI so far. Sorry, Greg, what were you gonna say? Hello. I was the interrupter. I, I just wanted to point out, as you were talking, you know, that it, it occurs to me, you know, that so many of these things happen, uh, they start out as a plaything, right? You know, they start out as someone's plaything. In this case, I guess, Jeff Bezos' plaything. And, and, and people like you say, wait a minute, this can do more than just, you know, amuse someone. This has a real application, which I, I think is, a great skill for people to have just overall um because you know it will broaden so many people's horizons anyway end of interruption well that's actually a perfect segue greg to uh, to introducing uh cynthia uh so dr brazil is renowned in the field of ai and uh robotics having been really a, a pioneer in both areas and uh, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing with RAISE, because you're really looking at how to bring AI education, not only at the college and postgraduate level, but all the way down to high school and middle school. So why don't I start, let's introduce yourself with the same two questions as, well, how did you get into all this? Why do you care? And why should we care broadly about it? Yeah, so, I mean, in, in terms of how, how I got into it, I mean, I, I grew up a Star Wars kid, right? I mean, I, I fell in love with these droids, R2-D2 and C-3PO. Um, and that's really, you know, kind of set me on, on my path to wanting to, to go into this field. Now I can tell you as a graduate student, the kinds of robots and AI systems we built back then, it was not about robots for the rest of us, robots that everyday people could interact with and get value from. It was about these very specialized pieces of equipment that scientists could use to explore the ocean, you know, or even send to Mars, right? And so that was kind of the world of 
autonomous agents and robots. And, you know, I remember it was literally the day that Sojourner and Pathfinder landed on Mars that I was like, that is amazing. I mean, huge celebration, whole field, right? I remember thinking like, but wait a minute, it's like, aren't they supposed to be like, like, like in our living rooms? Aren't we supposed to be able to interact with them every day? And from an academic standpoint, and again, this is like the 90s, right? 1990s. Um, no one was actually really working on that problem. And so my thought was like, so, so if you're going to have not trained people, like everyday people, children, you know, grandparents interact with these autonomous robots, like how do you design them? And so my, my intuition was, well, the social interface is the universal interface and they need to be able to interact and collaborate with us in a natural way. And we already knew people anthropomorphize these technologies, partly because of science fiction, but partly because we're deeply social and emotional beings. And when we see another autonomous agent, we're applying those social ways of thinking to understand its behavior and to collaborate and coordinate with it. So the argument was, you need to start to be building these technologies with social and emotional intelligence to be natural for us to be able to understand, engage, and to collaborate with. So fast forward, you know, we started thinking about, you know, what are the big societal challenges where this much more human-centered, personalized, long-term interaction could really matter. And it, it became more apparent to me that, you know, the rest of the field was dealing with like making things more efficient and, and driving, you know, cost savings and things like that. And I started really thinking about why can't AI help us to flourish? Why don't we thinking about it to be able to thrive, to help us to become who we aspire to be? Why are we building AI systems that help us do that? And so these social and emotional qualities and this partnership, it turns out is a critical way that we engage more deeply when you support the full, you know, holistic human experience, not surprisingly, people are more successful with the technology. So we started looking at things more in depth around education, personalized learning companion technologies for aging, for chronic disease management and healthcare. And these are all areas where the demand is far outpacing our ability to train professionals. So there's this ever increasing gap where it's clear that AI and technology has got to help us bridge it, but it's got to be designed in the right way. So this has been my world for like, you know, 20 plus, plus years. I've even like commercialized technologies around this, but it became so apparent that as we design these AI systems that can help us learn, that can help nudge our behaviors to be healthier. Well, it's a double-edged sword. You know, we're starting to appreciate more through social media that these systems can deeply shape us shape society, you know, our beliefs, our attitudes, all of these things, right? And it became so apparent to me as we started working with different demographics that people don't understand this technology and they really, really need to. So now this concept of AI literacy is no longer sufficient in society to be digitally literate. We really need to be AI literate. We need to be able to use these technologies more conscientiously. It's in everything, you know, like, kids are using this stuff right we need to be able to participate in the democratic process around the use of these technologies we need to understand them enough to be able to make those rational decisions around it and we've been seeing many examples now of how these systems can <coughs> exacerbate inequity and inequality in their design and so part of that is this is not a diverse or inclusive field right now it really i'm just telling someone it, it is not and we really need to change the face literally of who designs and creates and makes solutions with these technologies that are far more representative of the communities that they're trying to serve through these solutions. So for all of those reasons, that's why RAISE uh, was established. And so again, it's about responsible AI for social empowerment. How do you empower people with these technologies and education in terms of how do you prepare people to be able to learn all the skills, the concepts, the knowledge, the practices the attitudes to feel that this is something you can actually do and shape and help make a better world around. So, so that's how I, you know, pivoted more and more from AI that helps people, helps people learn to people need to learn about this stuff and be empowered to create with it. Fantastic. And one of my favorite examples from uh, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee's book, The Second Machine Age, about how AI is creeping into every aspect of our society is it's actually influencing evolution. And the way I, AI is influencing evolution is in dating apps, because dating apps have an algorithm that de determine who they show you, who you see next. And in some sense, if those algorithms are not programmed in a way that's that's ethical, you actually have, you know, 
one non-species programming a, a species we care an awful lot about. So <laughs> how, <laughs> how do we get responsible AI? Uh, I'm going to throw this out to any of you. How do we how do we move from an AI that's dominated by you know, a very um, typical computer science profile in terms of the people who do it to a more inclusive and more diverse profile. I, I'll just start off since I'm like, I'm, I'm living in that world right now. I, it, it's a number of things, right? So I think we fundamentally have to educate people differently. Right now, we educate people in silos, like computer science, like when you learn about AI, you typically don't learn about it really until college or graduate school. And it's typically in a computer science program. and the genie is out of the bottle. AI is way bigger than computer science now, right? Absolutely. So we need to fundamentally change how we educate people in the use of AI broadly, but even the people who design it, you know, I think, and we're finding you know, they want to learn the ethical design practices to think through societal implications. It can't just be learn about how to make it and then let someone else worry about what the impact is. The more the people who create these technologies are, are aware and conversant and able to engage in reflection and critique and dialogue, participatory co-design, really engaging stakeholders in the design. So how we bring design thinking into it is really important. I think that's, that's the way forward in terms of how we can educate and train people to be able to build you know, uh, products and services and solutions that hopefully be more inclusive and more equitable. Um, but a big part of that is also we need to train teachers to be able to teach it, you know, and so this is one of the big friction points too is, you know, it's getting it out there in a way, not just to students and schools, but, you know, teachers are not trained in computer science and AI, and yet it is relevant to civics, it's relevant to social studies, it's relevant to, like we've said, it's relevant to all disciplines. So how we, how we bring much more of our educational professional workforce, I think, you know, into this is also going to be really important. Fantastic. I'm going to index off of that, what you brought up a little bit for Noel and Greg. So, you know, I look, went back and looked it up because I wasn't quite sure of the date, but uh, it turns out it was 10 years ago this August. Mark Andreessen wrote his famous uh, article in the Wall Street Journal called Software is Eating the World. And uh, I was stunned it was only 10 years ago. I thought it was maybe 15 or more. And that article basically said, look what's happened to the music industry. It's been totally disrupted by digital technology. Hey, every other industry, we're coming for you. So in essence, that that are, that column was a warning shot across the bow of every industry to say digital disruption was coming. Cynthia just said AI is bigger than computer science, and I, I fundamentally agree with that. What are the uh, what, what do you guys think, Noel and Greg, about how big is this AI revolution? And if ten years ago it was software is eating the world, is it today AI is eating the world? Mm -hmm. I'll let you go first. I have some thoughts. Okay. Interesting I'm, just, I'm trying to be courteous, you know. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll take a, a first time and you can chime in. Um, so yes, uh, I'd actually say that um, I always like to remind people that we say AI, we use this term artificial intelligence. And I always think about the first time that I built. So I built over 100 skills for Amazon Alexa. Um, and none of them were uniquely like amazing from a software engineering perspective. However, it's a, to kind of quote Arthur C. Clarke, I, I will anecdotally, when my dad used these skills, it was magic to him. He was like, how did it know my birthday? How does it know that I love blue? How did, like, this is amazing. His eyes lit up in the exact same way that my two-year-old lights up when Alexa says, I love you back, right? Like there's this innate sense of you know joy and um amazing you know ness that comes from it but what i i will say specifically to this is that it is two-pronged i like the education idea i'm a big believer i think increasing someone's understanding that they can do this work even if they're not classically trained to do so so i do think that introducing these concepts earlier I call it inclusive engineering. Like my engineering team isn't a good engineering team if it's only engineers, right? And maybe they're engineers today, but they were geneticists in the past or anthropologists, or right? We need this richness in our engineering teams. And in order to get that, we have to do what Cynthia says, right? We have to encourage people, all people to go, it doesn't matter how you start, you know, it doesn't matter what field you're in, where your passions are, all of those things can actually help because AI and data is the fuel of today's world. So whether or not you, you are intentionally building it or whether or not your team shirt says AI on it, you're influencing AI, whether 
think, you know, whether and this is a, a quote from one of those movies, like Social Dilemma, where it says, you know, if you don't know what the product is, you are the product, right? <laughs> and that's very much the case today. And that's the AI is so nascent in what we do. If you don't know, you know like, what is AI, chances are you're the one feeding that AI project right then. Um, and then on the other side, professionally, like I said, around inclusive engineering, one of the biggest challenges I think my organizations, and I've only worked for big tech, right? I started IBM, went to Red Hat, Amazon, Microsoft, I'm back at Red Hat now. And all of them struggle with this idea that inclusive teams, building teams that can do exactly what you said, Cynthia, look around and go, are we serving everyone? Are we intent setting a good intention, a wide intention here? Those teams are hard to build and take a long time. And eventually you'll get that executive that will say, I appreciate the sentiment, but we got to make some money. And that is really like the societal change that we have to make. Because if we say, if we say, yeah, we're, we're cool about inclusion until it impacts our ability to make money, you'll go for the first person you can find. And guess what? The first person you'll find is the person we've been training for the last 25 years who happens to be a very specific demographic. So I think it's, it's very systemic, but you need all the things. I love the work that um, Cynthia, you, you just mentioned. I love the, that is necessary and we won't see the results of it potentially for 20 years. <laughs> um, I hope it's sooner, uh, but that, yeah, I, I feel like those two pieces are critical um, to this. I guess, I mean, the only thing I would add to that, I totally agree. I, I mean, the only thing I'd add would be that, you know, technology, I mean, and I'm not a, like a historian of technology, but, I mean, you know, from, from what I know, from what I can sort of surmise, I mean, it, it gets democratized, right? Um, you know, right now, you know, only, only uh, you know, a couple of the people on this panel know how to program AI. In a couple of years, maybe I'll be able to do it too, right? Because... You could do it now. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> too busy keeping my job, but um, no, but you know, it becomes democratized. So more, it's going to be opened up to more and more people. And I guess the, the idea to me is that you know you have to um, you have to get those folks ready. Just you know, from a from a sort of a moralistic viewpoint, to do the right thing when they have these very powerful tools. You know, I mean, one of the things that that Jim and I talk about in the book is this idea that. You know, STEM isn't enough, right? You know, science, technology, engineering, and math isn't enough. So some people sort of added arts to that, right? So now it's STEAM, right? Okay, so we sort of like project forward 20 years and we say, how about if you add an H to that for humanities? And so we actually just kind of jokingly call the school that we write about, the fictional school, we write about the Thames Academy, right? Which is sort of a, you know, a, a, we mess with the um, order of the, the um, Acronym, and so, but the idea being that humanities are really important to, to, to kind of keep in the mix, um, just because you know people are going to have to make important moral decisions with technology that they will have at their fingertips. And quickly, I want to just mention one thing before we move maybe on to the next thing, which maybe Cynthia can chime into as well. Um, but it one of the things that I thought I would mention is a couple projects I've been involved in. I'm just gonna mention one of them, but it was with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and actually the uh, data scientists at MIT. And I was part of this like hackathon and it was this awkward, you know, high school dance with data science on one side and like the curators on the other. But what ended up happening um, was that in the process of us coming together and the curator saying, here's what I struggle with and the data science team going, oh, I, you know what, I could help you with that. We ended up making magic, right? And now I don't, I actually think the curators were the critical piece to that. Because even if I, and I do this today, I build Alexa skills from my very narrow technical view of the world to help my son. The second I engage a speech pathologist or a special needs educator, the ability for me to serve those people expands dramatically and they don't know anything about the tech nor do I need them to, right? So I do feel like, and I, I think that's kind of, Cynthia, like what I feel like that whole energy is about is that you don't have to be a technologist. You don't even have to be a software engineer. We actually need those 
people on the other side of the dance floor that are gonna bring the problems, bring, you know, bring the domain expertise so that I as a technologist who happens to be good at coding can bring it to life um, in technology. So I just wanted to bring that up because Greg, you you no, hit it right on the head. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah you know, and I, I often tell a story, you know, now where, you know, when I was in graduate school a student, you know, you had to be a computer scientist to design a web page, right? Because it was all this esoteric HTML, blah, blah, blah. Now, many people from many areas of expertise can design web pages and create value. Mm -hmm. It needs to happen with AI tools. So, so I say like the, the Trojan horse of what we're doing is if we can empower kids to create artifact solutions, like we have App Inventor, right? App Inventor is this very intuitive coding platform that kids, people of all ages, can create actual Android apps and we're putting AI into that. Once that happens, that means you've now enabled a far broader part of society who can bring their domain expertise, right, into actually creating things of value. So, so again, I think there's so many dimensions. It's, there's the knowledge and the skills and the practices. There's the tools. And a yeah. lot of what we're trying to do at MIT is like to democratize and create these tools which have a much lower floor. We talk about low floor of, you know, of entry, high ceiling in terms of you can push it to create all kinds of things and wide walls of creativity. Creating the right tools and platforms is a really critical piece of this as well. But I think by thinking about kids learning about it by novices, it's actually a way to get at that for for society, you know, as a whole. Fantastic. And, and you know, we had a question, I think, that you just answered without even hearing the question, which is how do we just demystify all of this? Uh, and, you know, I think the field in some sense did itself a disservice in naming itself artificial intelligence because it sort of came out of science fiction and all these things we're looking for and can we build a giant brain and all these wonderful visionary notions. But at the end of the day, demystify this if you're a vocational tech educator or a high school teacher or a middle school teacher and you're trying to figure out what I can do, what can I bring into the classroom and how can I, how can I help my students who may not want to be experts in AI but may be passionate about something else but don't want to be scared of AI. Hmm. Uh, I'll start. That's open. Yeah, go ahead. Anyway. Or you could either. <laughs> um, so I, I will go from my very unique perspective, um, which is I was, you know, I basically grew up in tech. I was a cloud. Well, first I was an on-premises solutions architect and then became a cloud engineer. But I didn't know anything about AI. And I became very excited about AI when my world started introducing people that could be benefited from it. So, and I mentioned that before. So that that's where I started. I knew nothing about the technology. And I think what is important, and today you had mentioned, Greg, democratization. Like I went to Microsoft because they were democratizing technology. They were making AI basically available as a web service that devs could use. And I could teach people to code, right? Or I could give them a platform, right? Like Cynthia, your platform. I could give them a tool to build code. But now what if they could create translation or what if they could do computer vision or what if they, you know, how do I make it accessible? And so what I do today is I literally go and I, I demonstrate it one of two ways. Either I do this right in the classroom, let like a computer vision model, which today you can test right inside browsers, right? Browsers can look at you through the webcam and actually show you what it thinks it sees and just tell the students what that looks like. You don't have to be a technologist. You kind of have to love it a little bit. It helps your students if you love it when you talk about it. But you have to be a technologist to know, like to understand how that works. And I think maybe that's part of like the educational process. It's why I started AI Leadership Institute because CEOs need to know this stuff too. Um, and then on the other side, we already, the world has adopted voice technology and it is a classic form of artificial intelligence. So bring in an Alexa, build a skill. Today you can build a skill with zero code, get it up into production and give it to the world. Do that, like, and, and I think the most important thing is don't just do it, learn by doing, right? Do it as a, like, I think you'll appreciate this great, like as a journalist almost, right? Like document your story, share your story. This is how people learn, at least how I learn today. I don't learn in the traditional academic sense. I don't have time for that. I don't think the younger generations have time for that. Like they're like, give me a GitHub repo or give me a tutorial, right? I don't know how many times I went to Barnes and Noble olden days and picked books off the shelf and did all the labs, right? That's the world I think we can approach with the younger generations. Like give them hackathons, <laughs> you know, let them play. Yeah, that's my perspective. <laughs> You've just mentioned a number of great tools. I mean, since you mentioned the tool for building Android apps without code, you talked about ways to build, you know, Alexa apps without code. So I, I think, you know, one of the key things here is to 
you know, not be intimidated by these technologies because the technologies can get embedded in much easier to use uh, platforms and tools of the kind that AI Leadership Institute and RAISE, uh, Raise represent. Cynthia, did you have something else? You looked like you were leaning forward to say something. So, I mean, just in terms of how do you, how do you engage kids around this stuff? So, so we've actually piloted um, some new programs. We call it Future Makers. So Future Makers has an explicit mandate to actually serve under-resourced, underrepresented um, communities. So many of the kids and teachers we actually reach with our hands-on project-based learning curriculum are like from Title I schools, for instance. And what we're finding is that, you know, because AI is influencing and impacting everything, it's important to meet students where they are and what they care about. Social media, right? They love music, digital arts and expression. So, so the hook that you can design to introduce <clears throat> how these algorithms work, how they're being used in real applications, what the ethical or societal implications are of those applications. Like we have, we literally teach middle schoolers about generative adversarial networks, which is this new kind of more recent AI algorithm in which AI gets creative. So when you see these photorealistic faces of people who don't exist or videos of Barack Obama saying things that he never said, those are this new kind of algorithm, this generative uh, adversarial networks. And so deep fakes, right? And the spread of misinformation is an issue where, you know, AI can potentially be like putting gasoline on that fire, right? So we, we teach kids about GANs, both from the lens of creativity and artists and digital arts too, the music generation. And we also present it for this other lens of deep fakes. And we're finding that regardless of where these kids are, rural schools, you know, urban, you know, title one, whatever, engaging them in that dialogue, they care passionately about that conversation. And we just see jaws drop of both the teachers and the students when you introduce them to these things. So they're like, I had no idea. We're like, well, it's on Facebook and you can actually make it right now. You know, so it's so eye-opening from a digital citizenship standpoint and they know it matters. They know it's shaping their future in profound ways. And I think that's how you reach, that's how you reach your audience to get them to care. You just have to meet them where they are. But the great thing about AI is it is, you can talk about the lens of journalism and creative writing. So it's a tool for you, right? If there's so much flexibility in how you approach it that I think, you know, any student, so whether they decide they want to become a computer scientist and like a hardcore developer, that's one path. But even the students who say, I want to go into photography, I now appreciate how AI can be a tool for photography in my art, right? So I think that's what we're really trying to, to help broaden their their perspective on. And we also want to teach them innovation and entrepreneurial design skills. So they understand the process by which you take an idea and you can have positive change in the world. So we call that computational action. I didn't learn about this until after graduate school when I did my startup. We need to teach kids much earlier how you have positive change in the world. And the tools are getting to the point where they can actually have positive change in the world. So I don't think we have to wait 20 years to see these kids start to make a positive difference. I think that that curve is accelerating actually and we just want to make sure we're reaching a diversity of students in that opportunity and i think so you know take a long-term perspective if i may just uh set up the yeah. question a little bit uh you write in your book about three centuries of the american high school so if we can sort of zoom out to the third century here yeah. what do we need to do to make the classroom of the future different uh such that people have the civic awareness of this stuff where there's deep fakes and videos could well be fake ai can actually create things that are sowing disinformation how do we change the classroom i mean i i certainly think um and thank you for the book for the uh mention of the book um i, I certainly think that um you know just sort of stepping back a little bit that just classrooms in general need to need to look different um you know, one of the things we talk about in the book is this idea that um, the high school of the future is going to be project based. Um, it just is. I mean, um, and, and and when we say project based, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, that's kind of you know lightweight or kind of stupid. But the 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 lens through which we view it um, is is this: that schools are already doing this. Your kid's school, my kid's school, already does projects, and. The problem is they they happen after school, right? Um, they happen when after the bell rings. Um, so to be on the basketball team, it's a project. To be on the debate team or to to run the school newspaper, that's a project. They're all all the things that kids basically give a damn about are projects. And these are the places where they learn all these things that that um, 
everybody here has been talking about, right? Um, you know, they learn like iteration, they learn grit, they learn to, you know, be creative and, and work in teams. Um, we just don't call them projects, we call them being on the basketball team. Um, so for one, that's got to happen um, in a much bigger way. And it's got to it's got to happen, um, I, I think, in a way that sort of opens kids' eyes to a lot of these realities. Um, I, 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 we are not like very prescriptive in terms of like, how do you teach kids to recognize deep fakes? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think my co-panelists can probably kind of tackle that more specifically. Um, but I, I, I guess if I were to say kind of what needs to happen, I think from the very early age, like kids need just more cognitively demanding work in school. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of research that, that kind of looks at kind of what your typical like eighth grader learns in math class. And a lot of it is just like simple computation or like review. And it's, so the message that sort of we bring to the book is like, we need to just like raise raise the bar a little bit. We need to engage kids more in school. We need to um, give them a sense that they are doing something that's part of a bigger, you know, aspirational project. Um, we can we can sort of get into the deep fake piece of this um, if you like. But anyway, that's to me that's kind of like the the table setter for this. Well, I happen to have middle schoolers um, and. What I have found, and I'm not alone, is that p kids get into middle school and they find they have this realization, like, what am I doing? <laughs> and some of our kids who are raised a certain way actually start hard pitching that they don't need to go to school anymore. Like hard pitching, like entrepreneurial style pitching. <laughs> and I've now covered a huge collection of parents that are getting these pitches of 13 and 14 year olds going, this this system was made for a different humanity. We are not this anymore. And I love that. That's why I love about what you're saying in in the book that you wrote. Right, is that we have to actually change the bones. And my my daughter and son both were like, "Let's build a new school," and literally pitched me a new school. And it was exactly what you said. It was like. Children pick their their choice of what they want to do. It's kind of Montessori style, but for older people, right? Older kids. No, no. It was very much project based. If I want it, like he built a, an Alexa skill when he was nine years old. He now makes money on the platform because it's oh. successful. But he he's like, well, yeah. I learned so much doing that. Why wouldn't I have done that for like? Why didn't I get credit for that at school? Like, wrote his own graphic novel did not get, actually got like demonized at school yeah. for doing that and for not reading the classic whatever telltale art <laughs> that he was supposed to do, right? Like the world, yes, has to change and they're naturally gravitating towards artificial intelligence and technology because they're born in it. Like they're born in this world. We think of it as it's this extension. This is the world they're swimming in. And so like I did this series on TikTok on how to um, how to detect a deep fake. It was like a four video series, hit over a million views. And um, the funny thing about it though, is like all the kids were like, yeah. And all the older people were like, ooh. <laughs> you know? And it was kind of cool to watch their commentary, right? Like the, the teenagers were kind of like, of course, of course, yeah, I totally see it. And they're like, if you look really closely, blah, blah, blah. You know, they just have a different mindset and how do we, capitalize on that and grow them from there. I think more than I more maybe both of you said this, like how do we meet them where they are and grow them from there as opposed to being like, hey, let's teach you this 1940s style of education. And then when you're out, like you said, Cynthia, when you're out past graduate school, then you can kind of think about this other cool stuff. <laughs> well, it's great. It's so cool now. It really is fundamental. I have a college student. He's a junior uh, at um, let's just call it a top five computer science school in in, uh, in the U.S. Who six times since he started and he's now uh, completing his junior year has called me up and said, "Dad, you're wasting your money. I could learn this better from watching YouTube videos than I can from going to my classes. You know, the remote anyway. Why are you paying for this?" And you know, I find myself saying things I don't want to say, like, "Well, the, the degree, you know." And so, you know, the the world is is changing fast. There's a lot of questions in our chat about where can I find these kinds of programs, Cynthia and Noel, that you guys are talking about in Massachusetts. Uh, in Connecticut and other places, how, how can people who are educators or parents or students for that matter find and get access to these kinds of programs? 
So, I mean, just so quickly for, for Rays, you can go to rays.mit.edu. We have literally hundreds of hours of curriculum we've already developed, and we train teachers in it, and, and it's getting out there. It's, it's, it's Creative Commons. If you, <laughs> it, you can just use it for free. If you're a co company and you're interested in it, like we just want to at least have a conversation about it. But we're MIT. Our goal is to educate and get the stuff out there. Um, so that's where you can find learn more about the Future Maker program, all the different kind of AI modules, like the one I talked about, deep fakes and GANs, um, and many, many more. And we're constantly developing new ones because I mean AI, of course, is a it's a huge field. And our our aspiration is actually to go from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. Our sweet spot right now has been kind of middle school, but we're also expanding that. And we also care a lot about the adult workforce. So, you know, at open learning at MIT, like, you know, thinking about reskilling and retraining the adult workforce is also an area that obviously is a really critical need. So, so Ray's actually thinks about kind of like AI for the rest of us. Let's assume universities understand how to do it, but what about the rest of the educational system and the lifelong learning system? So that's really what, what, what we're, we're, we're about. Yeah, it's kind of like what my, my shirt says, open source. I mean, it's, I was literally going to, if you didn't say it, I was going to point <laughs> to you because um, like you don't have, the nice thing about this is that someone like me, who's an advocate, who's interested in telling this story, who has her their own story to tell, doesn't have to build the content, doesn't have to build the slideware, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can actually go to MIT and then go to a high school, which I have done, or middle schools, which I have done, and say, sure, I'll do a workshop, I'll do an assembly, I'll do a hackathon. I have had like kids in middle school building the exact same projects that I'm asking, to your point, adult learners to do. And they both have the equal amount of fun and, you know, because they're, it's not technically hard, but it's a mindset shift that has to happen for both of them equally. Um, I was one of those, like I had never thought I'd be in AI and now all I do is AI. I, I talk about AI all the time, but I'm mm -hmm. a classic example of you can just say yes. You can say yes when you're eight or 15 or 45 or 70, right? You can just choose at any time, like this is something I'm interested in. And because there's organizations like MIT and I'm sure other organizations as well, um, but I taught at MIT. Well, I did. I mean, I taught, you know what I'm saying? I did a hackathon there. <laughs> um, but because of my exposure to it, I was like, wait, Creative Commons? This is awesome. And all I have to do is attribute? Done. So for those of us who are educators, like it's not, the road isn't that steep. Um, and, and then you get to just bring your story. And that's really what students resonate with typically anyway. So love I'm it. Hoping, you know, I mean, to your point, I mean, you know, what I'm hoping will happen in the next like year or so is that we are going to start seeing the results of what we just went through. That is millions of kids like yours, Noel, like, I don't know what your situation was during the, the pandemic, but, you know, lots of lots of kids were at home um, and some of them had, you know, or OK. <laughs> I'm still twitching a little bit. <laughs> you're still still and you're still amongst us, uh, among the living. <laughs> She's smiling. Um, so no, but uh, you know, like I mean, um, what I'm thinking is like you know, lots of these kids you know, had access to these tools that like you folks are talking to you and Cynthia are talking about. You know, so we're I think we're going to start seeing the results little by little. I think lots and lots of kids, lots and lots of young people are going to start asking the same question Todd's son asked, like what. Why are my parents paying for this? You know, um, you know that I um, my previous book was about um, uh, games and, and learning, and it talked a lot about sort of like the affordances of video games and things like that, and why young people like or gravitate toward them. And one of the one of my favorite quotes was um, uh, was the definition of boredom, and, and it was you know the idea that boredom is rage spread thin, and like I've, I've loved that. Like ever since I heard that, and and I and I think that, I think that is going to be characterizing our young people for the next couple of years. Like they're going to be in these situations. They're going to be like, why am I here? Like why do I have to sit through this? There's so many other things I could be doing that like ignite my interests. Um, and and I you know I just think the possibilities to me are like really really um, kind of amazing. And we've talked about things you can do in middle schools, in high schools, in vocational schools, community colleges, colleges. There's there's programs out there that you can just use under Creative Commons. Let's address a couple other aspects of our audience here. If you're an employer and you have you know a hundred thousand warehouse workers and you're trying to give them a path to a more family sustaining career, 
what what uh, what would you recommend to employers? Well, I'll start uh, as somebody who I'm on the other side. So I was in a, you know, I basically was an IT pro, right? And that is a degrading, like it's it's on a downward slope because of exactly this technology. It's making things easier, press of a button. You no longer need 40 of us. You only need two of us. So what I was offered was the ability to really shift what I, the same thing, I'm doing the same type of work but for a different, um, at a different level. So I went from doing the work with my fingertips on a keyboard to designing the work, for example, for an AI solution or for a, an engineering solution. So I think part of it though, was that the leadership of the organizations I was in allowed me to do that. And I think this is part of a systemic challenge that we have is that there's not a whole lot of allowance in middle management to allow people to transition. That as, I mean, that was literally the glass ceiling I hit wasn't executive glass ceiling. It was literally a middle manager who was like, I'm not really sure AI is for, you haven't really shown any like past experience. You didn't do good in school. I'm not sure AI is for you. And I was like, it doesn't matter. Nobody, it's not for anybody. Like nobody knows what Alexa is. So I <laughs> went around him and did it anyway. But what if I didn't have that self countenance to be like, I hear you, I'm doing it anyway, which most of us don't, most of us have this imposter syndrome that we don't even feel like, especially as a woman, especially as a brown person in tech, like, I'm like, I barely think I belong anyway. And then I have somebody tell me, it's probably not for you, right? Like I think, but that's a systemic, he didn't do it because he didn't like me. He actually liked me a lot. They thought I was a high performer. He did it because he actually felt like if you don't have the stamp that we all want from a university, right? If you're classically trained in a boot camp or goodness forbid at Barnes and Noble by reading books, I'm not sure you could do any of that. And I'm proof that of course you can, but what are we doing systemically to change that response in the professional workspace? It's less about the tech. The tech is there. The education is there, right? How do we change the emotional intelligence of the layers of management that allow people to become more than they are today? Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to wrap us up with one last question, uh, which is any advice to policymakers, federal, state, local, anything that needs to happen on the policy side? Well, I mean, I think, as I mentioned, teacher professional development is going to be hugely important. You know, we need to have a, a work, you know, education workforce who feels comfortable bringing these ideas, concepts, methods, you know, um, ways of thinking to their students. And again, regardless if they're the English teacher, or the civics teacher, or the math teacher, or the science or the computer science teacher, um, I think professional education is, is just, it's, it's hugely important. Um, I think, you know, we're constantly talking about, you know, programming or computer science is kind of like the fourth R, like just making that more systemic across the country. I mean, there's certain pockets, certain states that are mandating that in the public education system. Others like in Massachusetts, it's kind of like everybody does their own thing. It's really hard, you know, if we could have all these amazing curriculum, it is hard even for us at MIT to understand how we kind of infiltrate the Massachusetts public education system across all the schools just to bring it to students. So we just need better policies that help us to bring these ideas into the schools and prepare the teachers to be able to teach it. It's just really important. It's so fundamental. I have questions in the chat about people who want to find project-based high schools or bring these curriculums into their schools or bring them into the company. So definitely contact uh, our panelists. And, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna wrap up here because we're, we're over time, but I want to really thank the panelists. It's been a phenomenal conversation. And I'm going to close it out with a, a quote that Noelle uh, actually uh, used when she was talking. Uh, Noelle was already one of my favorite people, but she's just elevated even a higher level by referencing Arthur C. Clarke. So Arthur C. Clarke was my favorite science fiction author as a kid. I actually uh, judged a panel, a limerick panel uh, with Isaac Asimov one time, which is a whole other story. But, um, uh, but, um, the quote that she referenced that I love is wow. any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, you know, what he meant by that quote is things are miraculous when they're new. Technology looks miraculous and it seems like magic. But I want to turn that on its head a little bit, because with the teaching tools available now, with the kind of people you see on this panel who are here to help educate your students, educate your employees, train the teachers and do all these things. Let's turn the magic 
a way, instead of being something mysterious that we can't fathom, let's make magic with our students. Because if we can do that, we can create a generation of people who will make magic for the next generation. So thank yes. you guys. I really, really appreciate all the involvement and everyone's involvement here. It was awesome. So nice to be on stage with you all. This was amazing. Super grateful for you all. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Take care.